it's the most number of pages in the out of service criteria is dedicated to air brake systems or braking in general because they throw hydraulics into and discs. But there's a lot of potential stuff there. And, uh, you know, it's and I, I'm going to beat up on my former profession a little bit. There are times that maybe officers don't explain perhaps enough to a driver. Hey, here's the reason your truck's out of the service. I found this. I found this. I found this. Perhaps more likely, as former DOT inspector Andy Blair implied there, did that officer just hand you the inspection report and send you down the road or to the parking lot with that out-of-service treatment with nary a word? I can't say that's any kind of norm, but it wouldn't be the first time I'd heard such a story. It's certainly true. Brake Safety Week is just about here. If you're listening on the release date for this edition of the Overdrive Radio Podcast, August 20, 2021, the event's set to get going Sunday, August 22, and run through Saturday the 28th, and inspectors all around the nation will be hopefully putting more outreach into their focus on air brake systems, as Andy Blair hoped for in that clip of a long talk we had earlier this week, specifically about the out-of-service criteria when it comes to brake adjustment violations, among the most common of brake violations. I'm Overdrive Editor Todd Dills, and since we hooked up with Blair this spring for a refresher on lights and hours out-of-service violations, we've been Looking ahead to brakes for a few reasons. There's a 20% rule, which says that if 20% of a truck's brakes are out of adjustment and in violation by a certain amount, then the truck is to be placed out of service. That could apply to the tractor alone, too, or just the trailer, or in combination. Yeah, it gets complicated. It takes a lot of years of dealing with this to understand it, and I do try and explain it when I was an, a DOT officer, trying to explain it to drivers. Well, this is the 20% rule, but this one isn't. Right. So, and you know, when right. you have a mechanic come out, okay, what do I need to fix? So, and there's a lot more to it than just adjustment. There's so many potential violations in that whole air brake system, it's not as simple as brake adjustment. And for all the rancor around stepped up enforcement that these CVSA blitz events throughout the year engender, at Bedrock, for any owner operator, we're talking about possibly the number one most important piece of equipment on the truck, as Blair put it. And on top of that, your brakes are kind of what you really, really, really want to work. You yeah. really want to have a good system and you really want to keep after it. And if it starts to have some issues, you want to get it taken care of because a good braking system perhaps is the difference between coming to us a nice stop or not being able to stop and rear-ending somebody in a big truck. Understanding the out-of-service criteria can be a very useful tool in preventing that particularly onerous adverse outcome of an inspection. Shut down until the problem is fixed. But to understand that is difficult if you don't have a copy of the criteria, only available for purchase as most of you know, though the price of the handbook has fallen markedly in recent years, and CVSA also has a smartphone app version that's fairly affordable as well. It's all well put together and pretty clear with its illustrations and everything else, as Andy Blair would have it, though it's not exactly riveting reading. If you're not familiar with it, it's like getting a, I'm old, I'll do the old school version of it, it's like opening a phone book and in, intending to read it for enjoyment. Knowledge of it, though, can be key to filing challenges to out-of-service orders that were not warranted. And I look very closely, and, and I'm certainly one to admit, there are times I have found things that, um, that's not out-of-service. I mean, it's in the right neighborhood, but, you know, that 20% standard hasn't been met. You know, how far out of adjustment was the brake? What was the brake type and style? A lot of right. things come into play here. And, I mean, fair's fair. If, if a person's out, they're out but I just want to make sure that it was done properly. And if it's right. not, you know, I'm game to file a challenge on something like that. I've filed 25 challenges in the past few years. I've won 20 of them and the other five I should have won. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why we brought Can't on Andy Blair today in hopes of at least getting some of the information contained therein further out into the public eye. He was kind enough to detail the adjustment portions of the out of service criteria and walk us through some of the rest of the component related infractions that can shut a truck owner down. Along the way, we'll offer thoughts on maintenance practices garnered over decades of experience in enforcement and almost a decade with a large construction outfit and consulting independently. You cannot fix a brake adjustment issue by simply adjusting the brakes. 
and and it mm -hmm. lasts. I, I compare it to a very slow leak in a tire. You can pump up a tire and it may hold air for a while, but you're going to have to keep pumping air because yeah, it's going to fix it. Loose. And yeah. once slack adjusters stop doing their job, the only cure is to replace them. You'll hear tips for detecting airline leaks. Out of service worthy if they're not a connection. I literally use a piece of uh, rubber tubing about two or three feet long and I use it like a stethoscope. And I put it up to my ear and I poke it in because sometimes I'm telling you, those leaks can be very hard to find. And there's more where that came from. Before we hand it off to Blair to dive into some of his history to start though, here's a quick word from Overdrive Radio's sponsors. Synchrony Car Care is a robust program built for your business and your customers. We offer drivers a way to pay for the services and parts they need today, but there's so much more to Synchrony Car Care. We treat your customers as an extension of your brand, and we don't take it lightly. We're committed to a simple application and fair terms. Let us help drive traffic and drive success for your business. FirstGuard provides commercial truck insurance to leased owner operators done right. As we've done for more than 80 years, we provide physical damage and non-trucking. Many companies make you pay up to six months of insurance premiums up front, but not FirstGuard. We bill monthly, so you get quality insurance without needing to pay a lot of cash up front. Go to FirstGuard.com. That's 1-S-T-Guard.com. FirstGuard. We speak trucker. Let's talk. Uh, my name's Andy Blair. I am from York, Pennsylvania. And at one time they made the York peppermint patty here. So there's our claim to fame. They don't <laughs> anymore, but it, there was a time. Um, and so born and raised here, I uh, grew up here. I went to, uh, after high school, I really, you know, didn't want to go to college, but I did right. not want to become the head French fry maker at McDonald's either. Nothing against <laughs> French fry makers. Uh, but the U.S. military will take you when you're 17. And so that's what I did. I went in the Air Force. I did the military police thing for uh, four years. I was fortunate enough. Uh, many people's parents helped pay for my all expense paid trip in the four years of military, including going to Korea and uh, Montana and Korea and Germany. And so I got to travel a bit. I came back. I did actually drive a non CDL truck for a couple of years like a delivery type vehicle. And right. then I did get hired as a police officer in 1986. And I was a police officer from 86 to 2012. Okay. And during that time, I did a little bit of everything. A patrol officer, I was on the SWAT team. Um, I got into motor carrier enforcement. I was certified as a DOT officer, cargo tank hazmat, advanced accident investigation. I did get my CDL back when I was still an officer, although it was just a B at the time. Okay. DOT officers are not required to have CDLs. Right. Um, I mean, it's beneficial, but it's certainly not a requirement. Um, so I, I progressed through the department and got promoted a couple of times. And then I left in um, the end of uh, end of 2011, beginning of 2012. You were with the state uh, police? No, actually, I was with the municipal department. Uh, in Pennsylvania, municipal officers are uh, permitted to do full DOT. They just have to go through all the state training, which I did. Right. It was actually conducted by the state police, even though I was not a state officer. Yeah. Um, so I had every bit of the same power and authority as any trooper, as far as roadside DOT enforcement, which yeah. I did. And much to the chagrin of a lot of the waste haulers in the area, uh, we <laughs> had a large landfill here. And let's just say I practiced frequently at the landfill. And um, a lot of those companies I became their maintenance program and I would call them and say, you guys need to work on some things here or, you know, you don't want me to be your maintenance guy. Um, so uh, I, I did that for a number of years and, and I left in 2012. I proceeded to, I took a position with a large construction company, uh, 1800 employees, about 1400 trucks of all shapes and sizes from the, the smallest to the tractor trailers and everything in between. And then uh, at the same time, and I am the fleet safety director with that company, but I have the flexibility and freedom to maneuver my hours and do things. I also started my own company called DOT Safety Checkups, LLC. And I do things uh, separate from my 
day job, right. which I do consulting and training. Um, I am a CDL third party driver examiner for the DMV. So I do the CDL testing, right. although I only do that here within this company as we're not open to the public, but we have 22 other companies that they own. So within that 1,800 employees plus 22 other companies, uh, I can meet their standard for getting the minimum required testing to keep my certification. So I do the full class A or B CDL testing. Um, not easy. Right. Uh, no gimmies. Uh, we do not hand out CDLs. You've got to work for it. Right. And uh, maybe some of the guys that have been out on the road for a while might think it's gotten easier. Maybe in a couple of respects it has, but. There's also some things that the, the new people have to do that the, the you know, the, the road dogs didn't have to do. So uh, it's not a, a walk in the park. I've probably given about 30 tests this year so far. And I would say the failure rate, at least for the first time, and they get three tries, is about 40 percent. 40 percent failed the first time. Most of them came back and passed a second time. So with my own company and I do this on the side, I do uh, everything from. Uh, C- I do CDL training. Um, I can't test for those people, but I can prepare somebody for the test since I do give it. Um, defensive driver, which is what I'm doing this coming weekend. I'm going to a company in Colorado doing a full day of CDL commercial driving, not just general commercial driving. Uh, accident response. I, I respond right. to accidents for some, for some companies that have me do that. They just want someone else there to look you know, for their best interest and haven't been an officer and haven't been to many, many accidents over the years, fatal and non-fatal alike. So I do respond to accidents and I help with data cues and just a lot of just general questions. People don't have, um, you know, they just don't know the regulations and, and perhaps they should, but not everybody knows everything. Uh, I don't. But I've spent enough time in the regulations and the out of service to become pretty well versed. And that's just a matter of time and investment of time in, in knowing it and then trying to keep up with it, which is another challenge. Sure. Uh, that's why we've got you here today, obviously, of course. Um, those, uh, those out of service criteria I know are, um, like, you, like, we, like you said earlier, not available uh, or not just out there in the regulations and you can't just look them up online uh, unless you um, are a subscriber to the the CVSA app that they have now, or you own a copy of the book, right? Every year that new, a new book comes out for the out of service. And uh, there are changes from year to year. They're not a lot usually, but they are there and uh, you can't rest and take a break and say, well, that's it. I'm good. Uh, I even keep the old books because in the, in the uh, likelihood or unlikelihood, I have to go to court. You know, the, the book that was in covered that particular time period is what counts, not the current regulation. Right, right. If you're looking at the current one, it's kind of like, you know, yeah, like, was this in here back then? I think, but I'm not 100% Correct. sure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I had to do the same thing as an officer with, you know, when they would enact new laws, you know, right. the date right. of this offense and, you know, was the new law in effect yet or, or not. Right. Uh, and even the, the, the general trucking, the DOT regulations do change from time to time. Not too much, you know, and when they do change, like the hours of service or the air mile radius, that was well publicized. Well, I think they did a pretty good job. If you didn't know they moved the 100 to 150, you've been living in a cave. If you're at all involved in the commercial world, um, maybe this non-CDL people aren't so much up, but they got the 150 anyway. It's just the CDL guys that got bumped to 100. But the out of service, yeah, the out of service criteria don't really... I mean, we kind of pick up on them, but they don't, when, when they change, they change in these small ways, you know, and, uh, right. and they're, I, they're not publicized. So yeah, I think it's, I literally, uh, when I get a new one, I put last year's next to it. And I go through it page by page. Okay. And I look for the differences and then I highlight them so I can, you know, easily tell, Hey, and some, I can pick up one. It's a job. It's a challenge to, to keep up. And I do, I always get the new books and the latest and greatest out of service. And I, I, I pre-order it. So, you know, I get it as soon as I can because I do use it here in my day job um, because I get a lot of phone calls from the 22 companies that, that I'm involved with directly here that I'm kind of it. 
I'm the person they're going to call and ask questions. What about this? What about that? You know, I get the, do I need a CDL? You know, when do I need a DOT number? When do I need a medical card? Some pretty basic stuff. But, but I understand if you don't live and eat and sleep and breathe in it like I do, it's, it's, you don't really pay attention to it until you get pulled over and you're told you're in violation and you had no idea. So this, so we're looking at uh, breaks this week because we've got the uh, break safety week inspection uh, event coming up next week and uh, uh, makes for a good opportunity of the week in advance to just kind of do some refresher type um, content on breaks. One thing that we don't have is this kind of close look at the out of service uh, violations. Um, and you have, you've put together for me a, um, a look at adjustment in particular and what the out of service right. criteria handbook says about this. Explain it to me if you can. It's all about the, the 20% rule, I think, across the board when it comes to so, adjustment. Correct. When you get into the adjustment, so, you know, brake adjustment, um, you know, pretty much every truck on the road today has automatic slack adjusters. Right up there with sliced bread uh, and the Mac machine. Great inventions. Not infallible. And they do a good job. Uh, automatic slack adjusters do need regular maintenance. And if they don't or not maintained, they will prematurely wear out. And no. then what happens is, and I've stopped many drivers, said, hey, you got some brake adjustment issues. And they say, I have automatic slack, so I'm good to go. I said, well, not so much. So typically when, you know, it's, I've even seen trucks that weren't required to have them and they added them, which mm-hmm. I think is a good thing. So I can't recall the last time I saw a truck of any age that did not have them. So it's, you know, there may be a logging company up in the mountains that doesn't have them, but, and using some old trucks. Uh, And and there's some actual CDL test questions that are current that go back to the pre ABS, um, pre automatic slack adjuster questions, even getting into alcohol evaporators, which, I haven't seen one of them in 20 years, but when you get into adjustment, um, adjustment, a number of things come into play. Um, the most important thing is the brake chamber size. They are sized, the clamp, which is by far the most common size, 12, 16, 20, 24, and 30. So as an officer, I have to determine what size chamber that is because the size of the chamber will dictate the legal length or adjustment limit they're allowed to have. And then you get into chamber sizes and you also get into long stroke chambers and regular stroke chambers. Some people call them short stroke. Some people call them regular stroke. It's just long stroke versus regular stroke. And if it's a long stroke, you get a little extra. So, um, you know, looking under the hood of many trucks and trailers, and some chambers have taken some beatings over the years and they can get rusty and corroded. You know, some they are marked. You can't always read them. You have to get into measuring. But once you determine the size of the chamber, um, it's right in the out of service criteria. It does give a good chart based on the brake type of what your maximum legal limit is on the travel. So you'll find two charts in the post that houses this podcast at overdriveonline.com. I'll put a link to that post in the show notes for those of you listening on a podcast player. Those charts detail max legal stroke for the most common type 20, 24, and 30 chamber sizes, both regular stroke clamp and long stroke clamp variations. To check the brake adjustment, I'd go in a truck, build the air up to about 100 PSI, shut it down, release the brakes. Of course, the wheels are chocked. And then I would go back and I would take my little chalk and I would chalk every push rod as it's fully or mainly or fully in, inside the chamber or at the edge of the chamber. If I have the benefit of having a driver handy, which I, I still do these, but for the most part, I do them on my own. I don't have somebody there. I have to use uh, blocks of wood and things to, to put the brakes on. If, right. if I had you there, I'd say, okay, Todd, go ahead, apply, hold the brakes, full application. And then I would measure the distance that the push rod came out of the chamber. And there's the length limit. So a type 30 brake off right off the top of my head is a maximum stroke of two inches. So I know right off the off my head it's two inch maximum. If it's a long if 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 you're at two inches, you're legal. If it's a long clamp though, uh, 
it's two and a half, right? <laughs> Correct. Yeah. The yeah. long strokes, you yeah. you get more. Yeah. And the, and the the out of service book does show a different chart for long stroke. Okay. So it's important that if someone is questioning this, that they themselves know what size yeah. and stroke of chamber they have. It is not one size fits all. I would say the type 12 and 16 chambers are rare. I see them very occasionally. 20s and 24s are very common on a steer axle and 30s are very common everywhere else. The drives okay. and trailers, okay. very common. Long strokes, um, they're out there. They're not everywhere. But yeah, I've even seen brand new trucks that do not come with long strokes. And I always encourage people, if you have a need or a reason to change out your chambers, I'm not saying spend the money just to do it for the sake of doing it. But if you ever have a reason to change them out, go to long strokes, get a little extra, travel there. Um, but I'll check that, that distance. And in a Type 30 break, two inches is legal. It's maximum. Yeah. But it is legal. I cannot complain. It's not a violation. If you exceed two inches, you're starting to get into violation. So DOT requires that a minimum of an eighth of an inch over to be counted at all. It must be at least an eighth of an inch beyond. So if I have two and a 16, it's not a violation. It just isn't. It has to meet that one eighth. Minimum right. of an eighth. So what happens if I get an eighth of an inch over? I have a type 30 brake. I have it. I have two and an eighth uh, travel. Well, that's considered a half a break. It's not a full break. It's a half a break. That's a half break so, in violation. Yeah. Okay. A half a break is a violation. A half a break will never, ever by itself put a truck out of service. It can't. It has to be added to another half or full break to do anything. So I get a break and I get a half a break violation. I keep going, checking the other breaks and I find another one, an eighth of an inch over. So I have a half a break. I have a half a break. I do add them together. I now have one full break out of adjustment. If I was on a two axle truck, one full break out of four would be 25%. The standard is 20. 20% or more, that truck would be out of service on brake adjustment. You know, when we start talking about a tractor, um, that's uh, three axles, um, <clears throat> six brakes. Correct. Yeah. You have 10, your typical five axle truck tractor combination is 10. Yeah. So in yeah. order to put a typical tractor trailer out of service, one full brake out somewhere and another full brake out somewhere, or it could be four half breaks oh four half breaks yeah four so, and that would equal yeah 20 cool. percent yeah, yeah there you get your 20 percent. if you have three half breaks not out of service no it's a violation i would write it up axle one break axle two break axle three break each one of them is a half it's a violation yes i i could not legally put the truck out of service from break adjustment it's close what if, what if they were all on the tractor though and not there's the times that you know, I could have two brakes out on the tractor and the trailer is good to go. And what I would do is say the truck is out, but the trailer is not. Is that common for is that common for people to do that, uh, for inspectors to do that? Put the truck out of service and not the if the truck, and you consider them separately. I mean, can I you do. do that? Yeah. OK, but there, I do consider them separate. Um, but there is a time we merge them. So, yeah, to get to 20 percent, if. Todd's driving a five axle truck tractor and trailer combination. You have a full brake out on the truck and you have a full brake out on the trailer. Yeah. You have 20% out on the combination because two out of 10 is 20%. Right. So that's called a combination out of service. So I would tell the driver, the truck and trailer are out as a couple, as a pair. Yeah. So what would happen then if the driver said, okay, officer, I get you. I would put an out-of-service decal on each. What if you disconnect the truck? Now you only have one breakout out of three axles. You don't meet the 20%. You'd say, well, I can drive the truck off. No. Once a vehicle has been put out, before it can leave, anything and everything that contributed to the out-of-service has to be fixed.
So he could, he couldn't uncouple and drive off. He'd have to fix both in order to. Yeah. So, but there are times I put just a truck out, and the trailer was good, or other way around, the truck's good and the trailer's out of service. They I mean, I guess it only takes a. It, it probably only takes a. Well, it take a, take a single break to put a trailer out of service. Eh? Well, um, full break. If one out of four no. would be twenty five percent, then yes. Yeah. Right. But that's where the trailer now had to be a full break, not a half. Yeah. So if you have that type 30 break at two and a quarter, that's considered a full break at a quarter over. Yeah. Then that's correct. That would meet the that would be 25 percent of a typical trailer with two axles. Yeah. And the trailer would be out and the truck could leave. It's good, good information on the uh, on finding the the type the brake type when they put the, the stroke. Uh, Stroke measurement, and no, that's the the measurement on the on the on the plate. On I'm looking at it so here. You measurement on the on lot, the plates on the chamber, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. you don't see that very often. Okay. More often, what you'll see is a little plastic tag, a little trapezoidal tag. Yeah. And I'll tell you, it'll show for a Type 30 brake, and it'll show 2.50 inches, and you're going to think, well, that's my maximum stroke. It's not. Yeah. No, the manufacturers aren't helping here. There's a legal man maximum stroke. There's a manufacturer's maximum stroke. So whenever you see that little plastic tag, and I've seen them recently, 2.50, subtract a half inch to get to your legal maximum. Right. So that's a two-inch brake stroke. And if you look in manufacturer's data, it'll say, it typically will say legal ma maximum is 2.2 two and a quarter manufacturer says two and a half, but the manufacturer stroke isn't what works out along the road. The legal maximum stroke is the winner, which is what you would find right in the out of service criteria. So the, the general DOT regulations for the most part, don't even get into out of service at all. They just right. don't. Once in a while, there's some reference to vehicles should not be driven, that sort of a thing. The out of service is a formal legal declaration can only be done by a certified DOT officer. The average officer cannot put a truck out of service. Now, right. they could declare a vehicle unsafe to drive and use another state law to kind of accomplish the same goal. But the end result of an out of service order is if somebody chooses to violate it, the penalties are pretty severe as compared to an officer just saying, hey, your car is unsafe to drive, don't drive it. Right. Or truck, it, it, there's a difference. And as a, as a DOT officer, I was asked to go to other jurisdictions and I did have statewide authority and I could go to another jurisdiction, look at a truck and say, hey, that truck's out, put my out of service decal on it, tell the driver, that truck's out of service, you cannot move it till it's fixed and I'd leave. Right. And, and I really, was not an officer in that area, but I had that ability. So right. that out of service is a pretty strong declaration with some pretty strong penalties built into it if the driver were to violate it. We've done a, a fair amount of kind of how-to sort of coverage on, on just, you know, the, the basic uh, routine maintenance around slack adjust, automatic slack adjusters. And it all comes kind of, I think it comes down to greasing basically, right? Yes, just lubrication. Kind of lubrication of slack adjusters is by far the biggest, the best thing any company can do to keep them working properly. If they right. are not lubricated, there's a lot of dirt and grime underneath any truck. Yeah. And it'll work its way in. There's a worm gear inside that slack adjuster. If they're not well lubricated, they start to bind up and they don't work. And so I would tell somebody, hey, you're out of service on brakes. And they would ask, can a mechanic come out and adjust them? I'd say, yes, they, they can do that. However, if all you're going to do is adjust them, it might take a week or 10 days and they'll go right back out of adjustment again. It will mm -hmm. not hold. You cannot fix a brake adjustment issue by simply adjusting the brakes. And, and it mm -hmm. lasts. I, I compare it to a very slow leak in a tire. You can pump up a tire and it may hold air for a while, but you're going to have to keep pumping air because yeah, it's going to fix it. And yeah. once slack adjusters stop doing their job, the only cure is to replace them. Yeah. You can keep manually adjusting them. They're not intended for that. They're not to, they shouldn't be messed with. It's a sign that they're starting to go. They need yeah. to.
So when I go underneath the truck and I see obvious signs of greasing, there's a grease nipple on there. I know, you know, and they just flood them with grease until it kind of pours out. Then hopefully they wipe off the excess. That's a good sign that they're after. And, yeah. and really, you know, three months, 50,000 miles, maybe six months at the most, but they should see some regular lubrication and they'll last several years, but there's nothing on that truck that'll last forever. Mm. Tires don't last forever. Brake linings don't last forever. Neither do slack adjusters. When a driver starts, to, hey, you got brake adjustment issues. That may be a clue. It may be time to replace them. Right. So the majority of our readers are running drum drum brakes um, with these kinds of setups, but uh, there's a there's a significant share that are moving to disc as well. How do the how do the various out of service criteria? relate to disc brakes and, when, and what's when the, you look in the out of service criteria for disc brakes there isn't much right. there's actually very little um the rotor the condition of just the components i mean there isn't near as many opportunities for there to be a violation or an issue on a disc brake as compared to a good old-fashioned clamp brake right. um so if i if someone were to ask me well you know which would you recommend you know, if you want the less potential violations or to be shut down, the disc would appear to be the way to go. Yeah. I mean, there's just not much, many parts and pieces to go bad. And I've seen disc brakes. Maybe they haven't been around long enough. And, you know, a lot of the discs starting to crack or rust excessively. They just they just last. There, there's yeah. a lot longer of a lifespan compared to the typical drum brakes and the typical clamps type brake components. So okay. it, you know, that's what I said, the, the largest out of service section in the whole book is, is brakes, which is true. Yeah. But in there, the hydraulics are very, there's a very, only a very few violations on hydraulic brakes, but not many have hydraulics. And there's just a very few on the discs. There's just yeah. not much there. When we're talking about the out of service criteria, other than what we've mentioned here, I know there's a lot more to it uh, on brakes than just the adjustment section and, and the, the, the few things sure, we've talked brake, about here. What, what else? What else is in there? Anyone? So, um, a, a leak in brake chamber. Okay, that's a problem. Uh, brake chambers have rubber diaphragms in them. They're exposed to cold and heat, and cold and heat over time they can develop cracks and splits. They can start leaking. Um, few drivers know how to check for that. Um, honestly, the easiest way to check is not something a driver is required to do, but that really takes someone being underneath the truck while the brakes are applied, which an individual oh, wow. would be hard pressed to do. Yeah. And honestly, that is not part of a pre-trip, but all drivers could, you know, build air up, shut the truck down, release the parking brake, stand on the brake pedal and lean out the door and listen if it's not a noisy environment. And if you can hear a steady leak with the brake pedal applied and then release, it stops, put the brakes on, more than likely you have a chamber leak. And chamber leaks are not good news. And they get worse with age. Uh, when and, and I would have drivers, when I would pull them over, I would have them build the air up, engine running, pump the brakes down to about 60 PSI. I wanna see the low air warning sound, lights, visual, audible, I need to see something. If that low air warning does not work, they're out. Okay. Even though the brakes are fine, if the low air warning doesn't work, you're done, park it. So then once we hit low air at 60 PSI, I have them hold their foot steadily on the brake, engines running, not just idling, not revving it. And then I'm gonna time how long it takes to go from 60 PSI to say about 70. What I'm looking for is the low air warning to stop going off. So let's just say 70 is that number. So we're, I need to see them climb 10 PSI in two minutes with their foot on the brake engine just idling. The idea is if you have a significant enough leak, you can't recover. Yeah. It, the compressor can't keep up because you're losing too much air due to air leaks. Now, if you have some minor leaks that will recover, and two minutes is plenty of time. A brand new truck should recover in 15 seconds older truck takes a little longer but you could have one significant leak or you could have add some small leaks together you get to the point where the truck cannot 
build air. It'll just sit there. It won't build. And if you can't re- build build your air back up, there's another out of service based on the leaks. Air leak, not at a connection. Air leaks are very common on trucks. They have many, probably hundreds of feet of airlines, depending. And it's not uncommon to find a leak. And, and a leak alone is not probably not an out of service. But if it's not at a connection, it's an out of service. But if it's yeah. at some sort of a connection, a T, right at the connection, it's, it's a violation, not an out of service. But if it's just a little bit away from that connection, think of a cracked or split hose yeah. or maybe road debris hit it. Good example, there's enough to shut somebody down. Even if they can build air, even if everything else works. But part of the reason when I'm underneath the truck and I'm checking adjustment and the brakes are applied, I'm also looking for air leaks. And I'm telling you, they can be a bugger to find sometimes. I literally use a piece of uh, rubber tubing about two or three feet long and I use it like a stethoscope. And I put it up to my ear and I poke it in because sometimes I'm telling you, those leaks can be very hard to find. Uh, so there's a lot of brake components as far as the nuts and bolts of literally the securement of the pieces. They shouldn't be moving around. They can't be missing like cotter pins, things like that, cracks and how it's mounted. There's a lot of other peats and parts, which I don't see too much of that. I really don't. I mean, I know it's there. It's pretty rare to see some missing components. Um that the, the brake may be functioning, but there's missing nuts and bolts and cotter pin type thing that secure the pieces in place. And right. I guess they're, they're, the thought is, hey, at some point this is gonna fall off. And those kinds of things are, I would imagine, something very easily seen on a pre-trip, right? So easily, easily caught and fixed before it uh, becomes an issue. Well, uh, yes and no, Blair said, delivering this little bit of perhaps unconventional wisdom about the value of third-party inspections we've heard many talk about in the past. Still, in most cases, probably true, that value, yet... I don't want to beat up on mechanics, so I won't. But mechanics don't look for what I look for. They just don't. Because I've gone through trucks that just went through a state inspection or a federal annual, and I found stuff. And I get it, and I'm not going to beat up on them. I think they are not as familiar with the out of service. They're familiar with fixing stuff that's broken. Right. They don't look for stuff that's maybe getting there. Kind of. I mean, I would say a a worn tire should be pretty easy to spot, but in the brake, you know, like a cracked brake lining. Cracks are not automatically out of service. You got to tell me more. Is it more than an inch and a half in length? That would be one of the criteria. So if it's an inch and a half exactly in length, it's not out of service. It has to be more than an inch and a half. <laughs> but it's going to be, some, if, it's, if it's an inch and a half now, it's going to be more than an inch and a exactly. half very soon. Yeah, and I would tell them, look, it's not out of service, but I'm letting you know, you've got about an inch and a half crack there. And if it gets any worse and you get stopped, you're going to get shut down for it. So maybe now's the time to... Make sure now I would write it up as a violation, but it would not be an out of service. Right. So, um, any crack uh, more than a sixteenth of an inch wide, well, that's not very big. It doesn't take much um, <laughs> to get yeah. a sixteenth of an inch wide. Sure. Brake linings, you know, quarter inch uh, for two piece and three eighths if it's a single strip. There's a lot of there's a lot of things that well it depends what the equipment is to determine where I go with that but generally a quarter inch is your minimum in lining thickness so a quarter inch you still have lining but you know you're getting down there um, and the front the steer axles when when you hit the brakes the steer axles do a lot of the braking forces thrown to the front so those front brakes are going to take a lot of wear and tear. No coincidence, maybe. The truck OEs first went to air disc brakes as standard equipment. Guess where? On the steer axle. Um, so anything that's loose, there's all sorts of missing, broken uh, return springs, anchor pins, cam roller, camshaft, clevis pins. If, if, if any of them is missing, you're out. Um, the adjustment is pretty much where your 20% rule, the rest of this is going to be an individual item 
regardless of the 20%. So you could have one breakout on a five axle combination and say, you're not out of service on adjustment, but you're out of service because your brake chamber is loose. It's not secure. So it's obviously not going to work. We're not going to work well. So, um, you know, the brake lining's contaminated with oil. I've seen that. Like there's a hub leak, and that's why a hub leak isn't out of service. That's not a brake thing so much. But on the exterior, if I can see fresh oil leaking off the hub, that's going to be an out. But if that oil gets into the linings, the linings are done for. You know, you yeah. depend on friction to stop, and you get oil in there. You may have some braking, maybe not much. But that oil-soaked lining, especially on a steer axle, can be a big issue. When you really hit the brakes and your one is braking and your other is not, you're going to get that pull, which is one of the tests that uh, someone to get in their CDL has to do for me is they have to do a, a brake test that involves checking for that at five miles an hour. Adjustment is still probably number one by far. Um, but pe missing pieces of the brake lining, it gets broke off. Yeah. Um, maybe hit something, maybe how it's riveted. There was a defect in the manufacturer lining and a piece just broke. Okay. Uh, there's things like that that can contribute to something like that. There's just a lot and it's just something and I have it out here in front of me. Um, you know, how many pages of things here uh, right. apply. So the air disc brakes, there's one, there's about five different sections here. Um, and I, to date, have never had an occasion to, to put an air brake, air disc brake truck out of service. I haven't seen anything that would cause it. Very few issues in that realm. So, you know, if someone's specking a truck, I would encourage them to look at the air disc brakes because I'm just not seeing the issues. When I look at it, I have yet to find anything wrong. I'm sure maybe as time goes by, a little more things will happen. Uh, but they're pretty good systems. The, the tried and true clamp brakes, they've been around for decades. It's kind of that if it ain't broke, don't fix it thing. They're very good. They're very reliable. But there's a little more upkeep and maintenance. Check on them. Um, you know, if you get a roadside inspection and you're told that something is wrong, it probably is. Um, somebody needs to look at it. But, you know, I went to California a year and a half ago. I did a two-day seminar to a group of mechanics, just mechanics. And we went through the out-of-service criteria book, the mechanical violations, not the out-of-service driver stuff. We went through every page in this book. I did over 600 slides wow. of pictures. I tried to show a picture of every violation. Here's what this looks like. Here's something you guys should look for, and you guys should have the same book. So when you're doing your, your PMs or inspections, and you think, yeah, I wonder if that might be an out of service. And, and you know, can I let it go? Or should I fix it? Should I call the customer and say, look, you have a two inch crack in your brake lining. Your brakes work fine. But if you get stopped, I can tell you because that's more than an inch and a half. You're going to get shut down. What would you like me to do? So this particular company actually notes on their repair order, called customer, advised of, you know, apparent violation, suggested that they have this item repaired, fixed, replaced. They declined. So if if someone were to come back, they can say, we told them that, you know, you guys should get this fixed. And we believe it's an out-of-service violation because they had the book. And the great nice. thing about the out-of-service book is even if I needed, I had a question about tires. And I went to the tire section and I determined it's not here. It's not out-of-service. It tells me that the tire section is 393.75. Then I know where to go look in the regular DOT regs to see if it falls under any sort of a violation. Right, right. Great book, great information, easy to read, um, not complex, but you do have to know a little bit about the components when you're looking at parts and pieces. Yeah. You know, what's a slack adjuster? What's a push rod? What's a brake chamber? Um, yeah. Different parts that, that you need to be familiar with. What I can tell you is, especially anything air brake or braking system, um, you know, CSA assigns points. Yeah. And the points are based on the likelihood of causing an accident. So a fire extinguisher being discharged is pretty low in the total toll. The brake system stuff is certainly higher. The out-of-service triples the CSA points. 
And on top of that, your brakes are kind of what you really, really, really want to work. You yeah. really want to have a good system and you really want to keep after it. And if it starts to have some issues, you want to get it taken care of because a good braking system perhaps is the difference between coming to us a, a nice stop or not being able to stop and rear-ending somebody in a big truck. It all goes back to even if you go, you're in an accident and the police say, driver or company, you have no violations. This other person ran the red light, ran the stop sign. It's their fault. No violations on the report. That is absolutely not illegal exoneration from getting sued. Right. In this day and age of litigious society, if a commercial vehicle is involved in a serious crash, typically serious, much less fatal, the chances of being sued are pretty significant. Even if the police say, hey, you're, you're not at fault, you did nothing wrong. They're going to go back to that driver qualification file. They're going to have somebody come out and go through that truck with a fine tooth comb, looking to see if they can find anything that makes this company look bad. The truck should have been on the road. Uh, they had brake, you know, they'll make it sound like air brake system violations when maybe you had a brake an eighth of an inch out of adjustment, which, yes, it's a violation. It's not out of service. And they'll try and make a big, big issue out of something like that, which chances are it has no impact. Um, and I would even doubt the driver would pick up on that. Right. So a lot of incentives to do the right thing and keep after these brake systems. And anytime, you know, there's a roadside inspection that's showing issues with the brake system to pay attention yep. and, and be aware of it. And I really encourage companies to get their own copy of the out of service criteria you know, so when they see a roadside inspection and it isn't really clear what the violation was um, between the federal regs and the out of service book, it should be able to explain more specifically. You know, you won't find in the DOT regs about the brake lining crack. It'll just say unsafe conditions. Well, that doesn't explain very much. Here it tells you the exact dimensions that I would look for. Right. And I would literally measure it and I would literally hold my little measuring stick up and, and take a picture of it showing, you know, the length of the crack, because I know I've been to court a few times, you know, you better have some uh, pictures or, or good evidence. And I would also encourage companies that if they get stopped and, you know, they're saying they're, there's a violation to put out of service, tires, brakes, anything they can take a picture of, please yeah. take pictures. Please get pictures right then and there. Don't drive a thousand miles and take pictures. Right. Take them right away and take more than necessary. You know, I felt companies that the, the, the officer said it was a type 20 chamber and it was a 20 long stroke because I went and personally looked at the truck and I was able to take a bristle brush and clean off the chamber to the point I could see the letter L <laughs> and I knew it was a long stroke. They wrote it up as a 20 regular stroke. That quarter inch of travel made all the difference. Thanks for hanging in and to Andy Blair for so much of his time. If you're out on the road this coming week, or if you're just hearing this and Brake Safety Week is fully underway or done, what have you seen in terms of activity? What did you do in terms of preparation, if anything? What's your brakes maintenance approach generally? Dial into our podcast line at 530-408-6423 anytime to weigh in with a message, story tip, or hey, just to say hi. We hope to hear from you. Overdrive Radio is a production of Overdrive, voice of the American trucker. It's edited and produced by me, Todd Dills, with no small amount of support from social media coordinator Holly Young, news editor Matt Cole, and executive editor Alex Lockie. Until next time, everybody keep it pro out there.